Good morning. Welcome to MRCC. If you're new here, my name is Tyler. I am the youth pastor here at MRCC. And introduce yourself. That's your cue. I am Brent. I'm the group's pastor slash will fix all your tech problems 100%. Brent's guarantee. It's, it's perfect. But hey, we want to welcome you here to MRCC. Uh, we have a few announcements for things that are coming up. Starting this weekend, it is our youth, our Northwest Ministry Network Youth Conference. We call it Next Gen Conference. It is going to be an amazing, amazing time. It is on the 13th to the 14th. We're going to be staying the night here at MRCC. It's for ages uh, 6th grade all the way through 12th grade. This is the second year that I get to lead and take students out that way, and I'm just so excited. So if you want any more information or anything, please don't hesitate. Give the church office a call, and I would love to, to uh, get you more information. Absolutely. And then we also have coming up this weekend, October 14th, that's this Saturday, we have our women's simulcast. Can I, all the ladies in the room, can I hear a hey, yeah? That was much better than first service. We got a packed house. You guys did a great job. Congratulations. Um, that is this Saturday from 9 in the morning to 3 p.m. I think there's going to be a light breakfast served at 8.30 is when they'll kind of have the doors open. It's free. It is super easy to sign up. Ladies, this is just a fantastic time to, to fellowship with your sisters in Christ, to worship together, to absorb God's word, learn more about who he is uh, together as a group. You can sign up super easily by going to mrccnow.org. All they need is just your first and last name. Super simple sign up process. Uh, if you have any questions about it, Cheryl's going to be out in the foyer as well. She would love to answer uh, any questions or help you guys get registered for that. You're not going to want to miss it. That's this Saturday uh, at nine. It's going to be the women's simulcast. And even though he has beautiful hair, Brent will not be there. I will um, not. Coming up at the end of this month, I can't believe we're already talking about the end of the month. It has gone by so quickly, but at the end of the month is our Baptism Sunday. It is one of our favorite Sundays here at MRCC. We just get to celebrate baptisms, and if you are ready to take that next step and publicly declare your faith in front of your friends and family and, and your church body, uh, we just ask that you sign up. We have a couple questions that we need. You can sign up at the guest center or you can sign up online. But we're so, so, so excited for uh, the 29th. Absolutely. And then the last thing coming up at the end of this month uh, is the holiday that shall not be named. We don't speak it, but um, you guys know the 31st, we're going to have a trunk or treat uh, hosted by our MOPS crew. And if you have a trunk, guess what? You qualify. You can help. Uh, if you have a desire to set up a trunk for the kids, just someplace where they can, um, you know, go around and collect some candy. If you want to sign up to help us be a part of that, um, you can do that online as well. That's going to be on the 31st and set up is going to be around 10 a.m. and the kids will come from from 11 to 12. So if you want to help host that, you're going to have to compete with me. I think they usually do a contest for the best trunk. And I like rig into our security system. I wear a security jacket, aviators, the whole nine yards. The kids are pretty into it. So it you're going like to have some stiff competition. Bouncer. You're going to have some stiff competition. They like to point at themselves on the camera and they're like, is that me? And I'm like, yes, it is. You better watch yourself. That's, That's better than mine. I was just going to throw a bunch of garbage in my trunk and have a bunch of junk in my trunk. There we go. Come uh, on, that was good. That a was theme good. is usually appreciated. Open your Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 16. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, yeah. We'll talk about that tomorrow, Tyler. All right. Yeah. <laughs> good morning, church. Welcome. It's great to see you. Welcome to second service this morning as we're rolling into the fall. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what are you doing with your hair? I, I, I kind of think I kind of think I'm bringing back the Beatles, at least for a Sunday. But when I got to staff meeting this morning, they had a different picture for me. They said it was more Justin Bieber, which I'm not really very, very happy about this morning. But I'm going to try and overcome that. Uh, but anyway, it's good to see you, church. Welcome this morning. Let's open God's Word together. We're in Luke chapter 16 on our road trip through Luke's Gospel. Remember what we're doing this year? We'll wind up by the end of the year as we're going all the way through Luke's Gospel because Jesus said that we should watch out for false prophets. There will be a lot of people, he said, who will use his name and talk about him as if he is their Lord, but, but he really isn't. It's a deception. He called them uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. We would call it today a deep fake, and Jesus said to watch out for it, and how do you watch out for it? It's really simple. 
as we pay attention to the real Jesus, we're always able to identify the false ones. And so this morning, we're in Luke chapter 16. And, and let me begin by, by sharing a story some, some of us may remember, but it's one of my favorite stories. Have you ever fallen into the trap of mistaking the identity of somebody you thought it was somebody that you knew or you were close with, but it really wasn't? Uh, when I was a young pastor uh, serving down in Lacey, uh, a family came and asked to do a, a wedding at our church on Saturday. They weren't part of our church, but they wanted to use the church for the wedding. I said, great, we set everything up. And, and then I thought, well, it'll be, it would be nice to attend, you know, and just to kind of bless it and be part of it and encourage what was happening and all that. So I decided to show up at it. The problem was the wedding was like at 11 o'clock and the Ducks football game was at one o'clock, right? So I'm like, Rhonda, we got to get out of there on time. We want to be there and pretend like we really care, but we got to get home for the football game, you know, by one o'clock. So, so I, I, we came up with a simple plan, which was, you know, uh, I would walk up behind Rhonda at some point while we were there, and I would just say, hey, let's, let's go, and we'll get out of there, and no discussion will be gone. That way we can stay. It'll be great. And so when we arrived, I made note of what she was wearing, and then we went in, and we had... <laughs> the wedding and then after the wedding you know people are kind of milling around and talking to one another and i'm doing that and saying hi so on and so forth and i spotted Rhonda's dress and so i walked up behind her kind of carefully and i put my hand in the small of her back and i i leaned into that spot just behind the ear where husbands talk to wives right and i said hey baby you ready to get out of here <laughs> And a lady that I'd never seen before in my life turned around, and she said, well, absolutely, let's go, you know? And then my favorite part of the story was she said, hey, aren't you the pastor? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you've had stories like that. You've had situations like that happen to you, I'm sure. You know, you think you're talking to one person, you're really talking to another. Actually, something like that happened again this week. I was coming out of QFC. I had a bunch of groceries. Uh, my, ha my hands were really full, and, and I dodged somebody who was coming in as I came out the door, and I dropped a couple of items out of, my, out of my bag. Well, there was a lady from the church who was just approaching, and I knew her. She knew me, and I thought she recognized me, but she didn't. Nevertheless, she saw me drop a couple of things, and she immediately stopped and picked them up, right? And, I, I, you know, and she handed them back to me, and then all of a sudden she went, oh, Pastor Greg, your hair, oh dear. <laughs> she said, I didn't recognize you at first. And then, and then it came through. I, I, I share those stories with us this morning because our Lord wants to teach us something about who we're serving and whether we recognize it or not. About who's near us and whether we recognize them or not. And very specifically, he wants to teach us about a powerful tool that he's given us to grow up in our spirits, in our souls, in our Christian faith that most of us don't recognize or at least don't appreciate the way he wants us to. So, so we're in Luke chapter 16, beginning with verse 1, and let's listen to Jesus tell a story. And, and can I just warn you ahead of time, this is an unusual story. This is a different story. Jesus is going to take a different angle in this story than we're used to him using. And so oftentimes people get a little bit confused by this parable, but it makes perfect sense once you understand what he's saying. Luke chapter 16, beginning with verse 1, here's what the Lord says. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions, accused of corruption is the idea here, accused of embezzling, of scamming, of taking advantage, of being a, an unfaithful, a wicked, uh, a criminal manager of his affairs. So he called him in and he asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you can't be manager any longer. In other words, I'm firing you. I'm on to your game. I know what you've been doing. And now is judgment day. Now is the accounting. Church, let's understand as we get going this morning that maybe the greatest lie of our time, you want to wonder how our world can go so far off the rails. Part of it is that maybe the greatest lie of our time is that judgment isn't coming. But it is. 
And Jesus is at pains to make that clear over and over and over again. Here's how the Bible puts it over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says this, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for what was done in the body, whether good or bad. Wow. Now, for those who don't know Jesus as their Savior, that's a pretty scary moment. For those who do, it's a very sobering moment. Because the Bible teaches in that moment, we either earn the Father's praise and reward in eternity, or we earn very little of the Father's praise and reward in eternity. So it's worth thinking about. Life looks different when you know your Savior is watching. And if you're wondering why our world can go so far off the rails, it's because so many people have lost their fear of God and their fear of judgment. And so Jesus starts this story out talking about that reality. Hey, that's going to happen. Sooner or later, it's coming. And the manager, verse 3, he goes on. The manager said to himself, what am I going to do now? My master's taking away my job. Now, that's just classic. The guy actually threw away his job by being corrupt and wicked and untrustworthy. But the sinful nature blames God, even when it's our own doing. And the ma manager, in this case, does that. He says, my master's taking away my job. job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. In other words, the dis dishonest manager, when the consequences of his actions begin to manifest, when, when his chickens are coming home to roost, when his choices are starting to produce unwelcome circumstances in his life, he doesn't do what better models and other parables do, which is confess and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. No, instead, he schemes and manipulates. He tries to gain control of the situation. That's what the sinful nature always does. The worst part of us, rather than saying, you know what, I was wrong, I need to confess, I need to turn back, the worst part of me wants to make excuses and then wants to manipulate the situation. And, and that's what this manager is doing. And, and he does that by not decreasing the wickedness that got him into this mess, but actually increasing it. Look at verse 5. So he called in each one of his master's debtors, and he asked the first one, so his business partners, the guys that were doing business with his manager, he asked the first one, how much do you owe? What's your, you know, what are you into my master for, we might say? The guy says, 800 gallons of olive oil. So the manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 400. Let's cook the books. Let's engage in a little white-collar crime here. Let's move behind the scenes dishonestly to control this situation. I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. This is how we'll both get ahead. And, of course, the guy buys it. He goes with it. And, and the manager perpetuates it. Then he asks the second debtor, and how much do you owe? And the second one says, a thousand bushels of wheat. So he told him, take your bill and make it on 800. You see what he's doing here. He's manipulating the situation by using the power that he's been entrusted with to do good. Instead, he's using it to get himself ahead, to cheat the system, to rig the game. And his idea is that, hey, after I lose my job, all these guys will kind of owe me. I can call in some favors. I can take care of myself and this situation. The manager is using his authority to, to do something today we call influencing others or to gain influence over others. Lots of people are willing to do what's wrong in order to get ahead and gain influence. You know, we live in a time when lots of people worship influence. And they'll do almost anything to get followers, clicks, likes, you know, horrible plague of our time. There's a website I'm sure you've heard of. It's called OnlyFans, where women, all women, are invited to become amateur pornographers, and people pay them for it. And, and I've seen several times come up in the news, hey, I'm making so much money, I'm winning by doing this. It's the best thing I ever found. You're winning in the short term. But what you're trading away is horrible beyond words. And you know what really makes me sick and angry is so many guys feeding into it trying to control the situation by wickedness, selling themselves for sex. Other people trade their integrity for money. They go into business and they say, well, gosh, I can't have high standards and, and get ahead. 
the way I would if I had low standards. So I'll cheat, I'll work behind the scenes, I'll, I'll take the shortcuts. Others live to just make an impression, to gain a reputation. They go along with wickedness to gain an advantage. Somebody offers them an opportunity and it requires cutting corners. It requires being less than honest and virtuous, less than Christ-like. And, and they're willing to do it, to get ahead in the short term. And our whole world, our whole world is plagued by people who are increasingly buying the lie that violence is the answer to our world's problems. Church, violence is a necessary thing God's word teaches us sometimes, but it is not the solution. It's never the answer. And yet, in road rage, in all kinds of temper unleashed, we, we reveal our worship and love for violence. There's a million ways in which we are tempted to take shortcuts to manage our fear of the consequences of our own actions. And, and that's what the dishonest manager is doing in this case. It reminds me, years ago when I was young, I was in Bible college actually, and uh, I was involved in a car accident. I, I ran into the back of another lady, and, and it was totally my fault, and the police could see that, and so they cited me, and, and I apologized, and thankfully nobody was hurt, quite a bit of damage to the cars. And so I, the next morning, called my insurance agent. I'd never had to do this before. I said, oh, I was in an accident. I guess that's why I have you in the first place, you know, and, and so we need to manage this. He says, I'll take care of it. Not a problem. Let me get back to you. So... A couple days later, he calls me back, and he says, okay, uh, I've got us a court date. Now, let's set up a meeting so we can talk about what you're going to tell the judge. And I said, well, what do you mean, what I'm going to tell the judge? He says, well, you were cited for reckless driving. You're not just going to admit that, are you? I said, it's what I did. I, I recklessly, it was my fault. I did it. He goes, well, you know, if you do that, you'll be responsible for all the damages to her car. That's why I have you, the insurance agent, actually. And he goes, so you're just going to tell the judge you're guilty? Yes. Why is that so weird? That's what I did. I was guilty. Well, long story short, what I find out is that he's contested this thing already, and we have a court date, and the other lady thinks that we're going to try and get out of it. And, oh, my goodness, what a mess. And so I had no way to get in touch with her because of legal issues, blah, blah, blah. So it comes the day that we're to go to court, and I'm just feeling terrible. She shows up. She's got an attorney. She's looking all worried. I walked up to her in the courtroom and said, I'm so sorry this all happened because my insurance agent was a knucklehead. I said, I never meant for this to happen. I'm not going to contest this. It was my fault. We both know that. And her attorney was looking at me like I was an alien. <laughs> then, it, then it came time. The, the judge called our case forward, and I walked up. I said, Your Honor, can I just say something right at the outset? I said, sure. I said, this is all a mistake. It was my fault. I did it. I'm guilty. Okay. She, I, my insurance agent set all this up. I wish he hadn't. Uh, this is my fault. It's, I'm guilty. <laughs> I'll never forget the judge. He looked at me and he goes, well, that is the most refreshing thing I've heard in a long time. <laughs> he says, you got insurance to cover this? I said, yeah. He says, why don't you get out of here? No fine. And he canceled my reckless driving ticket. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen every time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But here's the thing that struck me. Why would somebody think that's so weird? When in fact it should be the most normal, natural thing in the world. But it's not the case with this dishonest manager. Let, let me ask you to ask yourself, when are you tempted to sacrifice what's right and good for some temporary short-term get-ahead? When, when are you tempted to manipulate your situation in a way that's not honest, that's not godly, that's not righteous? in an effort to kind of get ahead, control the situation, get in with the right crowd. That temptation is around us all the time. Jesus knows that, and so he tells this story. He knows we wrestle with that. The temptation to trade character for advantage will always be there. And, and here's the thing. In the short term, it often works. Look at verse 8. The master commended the dishonest manager because he'd acted shrewdly. Here's where we start to get confused. Jesus, what are you saying? <laughs> we expect the master to come back and say, oh, you're even more wicked. But no, the master, we find out, was just as wicked as the manager all along. <laughs> and when he sees what he's done, he actually goes, huh, wow, you're good at this game just like me. He commended the dishonest manager for acting shrewdly. We're used to the master in the story representing God, but in this story, he doesn't. Jesus has taken a different tact. And then the master says, for the people of this world, here's the key, friends, are more shrewd, clever, capable, tricky, 
are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. Now, here's where we can get confused. Because we're used to the manager again, or the authority figure in Jesus' parables kind of standing in for God. But this time, that's not the case. What Jesus is saying is, catch this, friends. You can get a hold ahead in this world in the short term by cheating, by shortcutting, by lying, by manipulating. You can get a little bit ahead. And everybody in the world understands it. And that's how they operate. But the point of Jesus telling a story is he wants to teach us that's not how I want you to operate for a very specific reason. And let's learn what that reason is. Let's go on ahead. Verse 9, having told the story, Jesus says this. Here's the point. He says, I tell you, Greg, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Now, what he's saying is different than what the manager did. When he talks about gaining friends for yourself, he's talking about eternally. And what Jesus is saying is, hey, understand that the things of this world, money in particular, the advantages we have, the abilities we have, and pointedly in this story, the money we have, are tools that God wants us to understand are invested, can be invested in eternity. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, hey, you got stuff, you got abilities, you got authorities, you got prerogatives, you got powers, you got money. He says, learn to use it in a way that gains eternal reward, in a way that gains God's praise. Because here's the reality, friends, going back to the judgment piece, you and I are all going out of here. Here will seem like the blink of an eye, and eternity lasts forever. And Jesus says, I want you to understand this. I want you, you're mine. I've given my life to save you. You've chosen to be my followers. I want you to understand how to get ahead in the big picture, not just in the short term, not just in a small situation. The dishonest manager understands that money is a tool that he can use to get ahead in this world. Jesus says, Jesus is lamenting that believers don't understand it's a tool to get ahead in the next world. And that's why he says in verse 8, for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. In other words, the people of this world know money as a tool. They use it for the wrong reasons. My people don't know money as a tool and the power of using it for the right reasons. Look, I've got to confess, friends, my wife and I didn't grow up in church homes, so when we, as a young married couple, first started going to church and they talked about giving, you know, we just thought it was $10 in an offering plate each week. That's what everybody does, and then we all carry on. But after nine months, a year of being in church, our pastor taught a little series on what the Bible says about giving, and it blew our minds. We learned that Jesus teaches that giving is a tool to build my spirit. I would have assumed there's no connection between money and my spirit. Jesus says exactly the opposite in this parable and in many other places. And what it boils down to is this. Jesus says, I want you, Greg, to understand that money is a tool to build your spirit, your relationship with me, and to build your eternal reward. And when you use money to help and serve the needy people around you, that's actually an investment in eternity that comes back multiplied many times over. Let, let me just ask you again to ask yourself, have you grasped this somehow? Those who have walk in the habit of giving, whether it's a church or in their neighborhood or in their community or in their family, they just understand how this works. But not everybody does. And that's why Jesus is teaching this parable. Often we try to use money to create a sense of security for ourselves in this world. Jesus says, no, use it to gain eternal reward beyond this world. It's counterintuitive in some ways. I remember when I was first uh, getting serious about soccer, learning to play soccer, and um, our coach taught me something that really stuck with me. He said, Greg, when you shoot the ball at the goal, everybody's tendency, everybody's default is to look at the goal Look where you want to kick it and then kick it. The problem is that's a recipe for disaster because when you go to shoot the ball like that, you're almost always going to shoot it way up in the air. You're going to kick it high because your head's up, your back's, you're going to tend to lean away from it. And when you kick it, it's going to go way high. And that's why people look so foolish taking shots to win money at halftime because they don't understand this. He 
He says, no, 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 you can understand that when you go to take a shot, you want your head down, your shoulders forward. You want to be over the ball. Then when you hit it, it goes in a straight line. It goes where you want it to go. And in the same way, Jesus says, hey, when you think of money as your security, or when you think of money as just a way to get ahead in this world, you're actually missing it, and you're wasting it. He says, I want you to understand that it's a tool to earn eternal reward. Jesus goes on to say, explaining this in verses 10 to 12, listen to him. He says, so whoever can be trusted with very little, whoever's given money and they use it well, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. But whoever's dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? In other words, God says, your financial life is me fathering you is me growing you up. When Isaiah was little and he got old enough, Ron and I began to give him an allowance. Why did we give him an allowance? Because he desperately needed money? No, he was an only child. He didn't need anything. He was spoiled rotten, okay? But we gave him money because we wanted him to learn how to handle it. All right, son, we're going to give you this money. Now, what's the first thing you do with it? Well, the first thing is I honor God. You know, And then the second thing is I help people. And then the third thing is I enjoy it as the gift that it is. We wanted him to learn that. And that's why we gave it to him. In the same way, God says, Greg, that's why I give you money. And God says to us this morning, that's why I give you money in order to parent you. Because I can see by how you handle it now, the condition of your heart and how ready you are for the kingdom to come. It's a test. It's a parenting tool. And when we grasp that, then we've learned what Jesus wants us to learn. When Isaiah learned to use his allowance well, what do we do? We increased it. <laughs> and then we began this process. And one of the few things we seem to have done well in parenting him was teaching him about money. He's got no debt. He doesn't get himself in a mess. And we rejoice in that every time. Well, in the same way, God wants us to learn and grow. When we've been faithful with a few things, when we've been trusted with the small things, then that's a cue that we're ready for more. You know, about a year ago, we as a church found ourselves looking for a new youth pastor. You probably remember Pastor Josh and Nicole went off to serve a church in Phoenix, uh, kind of the fulfillment of an arc through uh, his internship and his time here. And so it was time to, to call a new youth pastor. And we prayed about it and we talked about it and we cast a broad net. So we went nationwide looking for a youth pastor. And through a long process of resumes and conversations and praying, we got to the point where there were kind of three candidates One of them was a young man from New Orleans. One was a young man from Illinois. Another one was our own Pastor Tyler, who's here with us. Well, in that process, it was Pastor Tyler's deep desire to become our youth pastor. But we needed to do our due diligence and go through the whole process and say, God, what do you want? And so we brought in these other candidates. Even though in the interim, Tyler was carrying the ball and leading, we brought in these other youth pastors. Well, here's what I noticed as we brought them in and they led a youth service. I watched Tyler, who knew that they were competing for the job. It's not really a job, but the position that he was aiming for. I watched him do everything he possibly could to make sure they succeeded while they were here with us. And I sat back and watched that, and I said, okay, that, that tells me what I need to know. He cares about the kids more than anything. He's not about himself. And when we had our conversations as a staff and board, it was like, okay, that's, that's a dead giveaway. That's the guy we want. And in the same way, God is watching you and me as a father and saying, wow, what are they going to do with what I entrust him? Have you learned that your money, your financial life is a tool God is using to grow you or not? Jesus goes on to put a very fine point in it. Look what he says in verse 13. He says, no servant can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. So Jesus tells this parable and he says, you know what? It's not just a generalization. It's also specifically about your financial life. And here's the reality, again, that I would never have guessed as a new believer. Jesus says there's a direct connection between my wallet and my relationship with God. I would assume those two things have nothing to do with each other. But Jesus says that, in fact, they do. And and what we must choose, he says, you can't serve both. So you have to choose which one comes first in your heart. Serious followers of Jesus 
have made that choice. And here's the thing. Once you make it, you don't regret it. You just continue with it. So Ron and I are new believers. We learn about this thing called tithing. We learn about this thing called giving beyond that. And, and we're thinking, you mean if we give, God promises security to us? That doesn't make sense on one level. But on another level, that's how faith grows. And so we made the decision to do that. And I can't tell you, many of us sitting here can tell you, but the reality is, I can't tell you how profoundly that affected our relationship with God once we began to submit our finances to him. I wouldn't have guessed that that changed my heart, but it did. And to this day, we continue in it. Again, anybody who's... Uh, surrendered their financial life to, uh, to God will say the same thing. And Jesus talked about this often. Over in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, he put it this way. He said, where your treasure is, wherever you choose to put it, there your heart will be also. Your love for God multiplies as you submit your financial life to him. Nobody would guess that. But Jesus is saying that that is the case. And he says, I want you to understand that the money in your life is a tool to grow your relationship to God and to bless those around you and to invest in eternal reward. Now, as we get ready to kind of wrap this up this morning, it's important for us to understand how to bring this idea down to everyday life, Tuesdays and Wednesdays and weeks that we live in, the, the everyday life. So there's a, there's a couple of simple steps to take. The first one is to, to surrender your worry to surrender your worry. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, don't worry about what you'll eat, what you'll wear, where you'll live. Don't worry about those things. Your heavenly Father knows you need them. But then Jesus makes a promise to live by. I want to invite you to put your feet firmly on this promise. Here's what he says. He says, seek first his, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. Put God first in your financial life, and he says he will take care of you all the way to the end. That's a step of faith, church, but Jesus says it makes all the difference in our hearts. When we take it, we grow. He doesn't want you to live with worry. He wants you to live instead knowing that as you, in an ongoing way, trust him financially, then he provides for you and takes care of you and sees you to the end. Those of us who've learned this lesson will never turn back. We'll do it till we're dead because of the beauty of what God does in it. And then the second thing is when you give to do so of your own free will. Here's how the scripture puts it in 2 Corinthians 9. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So there's kind of an old wives' tale that hangs around the church subculture. And here's the old wives' tale. God demands that you honor him by the tithe, and if you don't, you're bad. Church, that is not what the Bible teaches. The tithe is a principle that enables us to learn how to surrender our financial life to God. It is not a law on which God punishes or doesn't punish. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 tells us that what matters most to him is that we freely choose to enter into our giving. The tithe is a beautiful principle. If only our government operated on it, right? 10% means if you only have a little, you only give a little. But if you have a lot, you're able to give a lot. And it's a sliding scale. It's common sense. Every time I think about it, I want to say, duh, but we learn how to give by practicing that principle. It is a tool that God gives us to parent us in our giving. When we do these two things, when we enter into this simple reality, the reward that comes back to us is both eternal and present. Remember when we started this morning, we talked about uh, mistaken identity. Let me kind of bring that full circle. Over in Matthew chapter 25, and then we're going to finish with a story. Jesus tells a story about what we do with what we have. And here's what he says. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory and all the nations will be gathered before him. It's judgment. It's a day that's ahead for you and me and everybody. All the nations will be gathered before him and he'll separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. 
And when he says goats, he's not talking about Tom Brady or Wayne Gretzky, just so you know that, all right? He's talking about something different. He says he'll put the sheep on his right, the place of honor, and the goats on his left, where all New England patriots belong, right? On the left of the throne of God. But seriously, then the king, catch this, here's the point. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, your reward, the eternal, goes on forever. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And then the righteous, the righteous, catch this, mistaken identity. The righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry? I mean, that would have really been something, Jesus, to see you physically and to notice that you were hungry. When did we see you hungry? And the king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. In other words, if we want to serve God, he is present in the needs of those around us. Our neighbors, our family, our friends, sometimes our enemies. And Jesus says a lot of people don't know that. But that's the reality. And at the judgment, that reality will be made manifest. Lots of us dream of serving Jesus because we love him, we felt his grace, he's changed our lives, and we want to serve him, and he says that he is present in the people near us who need help. Notice what Jesus says, the least of these brothers of mine. He's not talking about world-changing movements. He's talking about what's going on in your world and mine. The little things, the needs that are near us, then he will say to those on his left, the goats, including Tom Brady, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels for the same reason. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you didn't look after me. And they will answer, Lord, when did we see? Notice. These are not people who say, well, you're nobody to me. They call him Lord. They think of themselves as spiritual people. And they say, well, if we'd known it was you. He said, I'm telling you, in them was me. In their need, you had an opportunity. And you chose not to take advantage of it. I was sick and in prison. You did not look after me. They all answered, Lord, when did we see you hungry? They didn't even know they were missing it. You know, you talk about super villains. And the reality is that every good storyteller or writer will tell you the key to a good hero story is a real believable villain. <laughs> you know, uh, you take the Avengers story, and the truth of the matter is that Thanos is a fantastic villain. Why? Because Thanos thinks he's doing good. He says, the universe is overpopulated. I'm going to wipe out half the population. Then there'll be less suffering. And he perceives himself as doing good. Edmund Burke said the difference between a bad man and an evil man, the bad man knows he's being bad. The evil man has convinced himself he's doing good. And that's Thanos in the story. And that's these characters in this parable. They didn't even know what they were missing. Jesus wants you and me, his followers his sons and daughters, to understand that he's at work in our financial life and in the needs of those near us. And when we meet those, when we meet those, we are an eternal reward. We put our money to the best possible use it could ever be put to. I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. So let me ask you this morning, what's your ambition with your money? Do you understand that your financial life is a tool that God is using to father you. And when you understand that and embrace that, Jesus says the reward is tremendous. When your kids were growing up, you wanted them to learn things and you hungered for them to learn what you knew. That's what Jesus is doing in this moment, teaching us. So what's your ambition financially? You know, the first step to surrendering your finances to God is just getting in the habit of choosing regular giving. 
And the next step is to begin to give outside of that regular giving when you see opportunities, small opportunities in your life, near you, around you. God says, I'll wipe away your worries. I'll fill you with joy and you'll be earning eternal reward beyond belief. Let me, let me finish with the story. The July 25th, 2019 Des Moines Register newspaper and website carried the amazing story of Dale Schroeder. Now, Dale was an ordinary, blue-collar, lunch-pail kind of guy. He worked his whole life as a carpenter at Mole Millworks in Des Moines, where he was born and where he eventually passed on to the next life. In 2005, he made an appointment with an attorney and explained that it had come into his heart to do something special with his income going forward. He had always wanted to go to college when he was growing up. The opportunity wasn't there. Now he wanted to give that opportunity to somebody else. And so he said from that point forward, he wanted to set up a fund. He wanted to give to it regularly out of his paycheck. And for the next 16 years, he did exactly that. And here was the result. He gave away enough money, as it turned out, simple carpenter, to pay the full tuition of 33 strangers through college. Three teachers, three doctors, two professional social workers among them. The only qualification for the Dale Schroeder Scholarship was that the people who accepted it must agree to find some way to do something similar on their own for other people. If you were willing to make that commitment, then the scholarship was all yours. How they did it was up to them. To this day, every year, that group of people meets around Dale's lunch pail in the cafe next door to the mole millwork. They call themselves Dale's Kids. And they meet to share about what they're dreaming and doing with their finances to honor what Dale did for them. <laughs> I kind of want to be a part of that club. Anybody else? God says that's what our money is for. That's what it's for, is to win that kind of life. And so God invites us to recognize that reality and to walk in it that we might grow up in his spirit. Would you close your eyes and pray with me this morning? God, we thank you for your word today, Jesus. We thank you for teaching us, for caring about us enough to teach us. Your heart is for us to know what money is for, to be free from worry and to be able to be a blessing in this world and to be able to be rewarded eternally. God, help us to understand that. Send us from here learning not to worry because we give learning to discover joy because we give learning to know you because we give we pray for that send us from here growing up in you we prayed in jesus name amen amen would you stand with me church <clears throat> jesus put it beautifully over in acts chapter 20 verse 35 he said this it is more blessed more joyful to give than receive and you only learn that by choosing to give. So now, may the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit go with you throughout this week. Go with God, tell someone you love them, have a great afternoon.